favorite. It's Judd's Hockey Show. Playing from in front tonight, just how, how nice was that, especially knowing they were going to come out. Where is Sarah? Yeah. Where is she? She's right in. She's on down. Oh, yeah, whatever. Of yeah, of course. <laughs> Finally, we get a lead. <laughs> no, it, um, yeah, I mean, it was nice. I mean, clearly, uh, uh, especially to take maybe a little bit of their jump away. Um, you know, the fans were fantastic here tonight. They haven't seen hockey for a long time, and, and their group was energized. And for us to get that first one maybe gave us a little bit of an edge. It's all last for Dean Evison and company all last. when you are five and one. Welcome into mm-hmm. Judd's Hockey Show. Zolgad, Declan Goff, reacting to what we saw last night in Vancouver. A very impressive, and I thought a very quality 3 2 road win. It was uh, to what Dean was saying there, the Canucks opener, the first time in like, um, I don't know, what, a year and a half or so that they had played in front of a full house in Vancouver. And the Wild gets out of there with a 3-2 win and improves to 5-1. And, one. and uh, Declan, let's just start here. Yeah. 5-1, and one, mm-hmm. one, one bad game, um, five five wins. But I, I think last night might have been the most impressive because to, to what they just talked about, the Wild scored first, which they hadn't done in their first five games. They mm-hmm. scored the first goal. Cam Talbot last night i thought was exactly yeah. what we've talked about um they fell behind for the most part in the first in their first um five or what four games five games they fell behind in those games because yes they didn't get off to great starts but you know what they also didn't get in those games they didn't get that like big save that big first period save that big first save right where you're like okay that that is an impressive save you got that Last night, Cam Talbot made a great stop on Brock Besser. I think he made about two or three stops in the first period that were really, really good. Mm-hmm. That blueprint last night for a win, pretty impressive. Yeah, I thought so too. Um, Talbot has looked um, has looked about who I think Cam Talbot is. That's what I told you after after the loss of the Preds on Sunday. Um, but he has yet to really look in control of the game, and I thought yesterday was his most complete game. There there was moments in the first period, two, three chances by um, by Vancouver early on that could have easily got the first goal or tied things up right away, and, and Talbot stood tall. And I thought that was a huge moment for him to not get flustered and to get a big-time save when his team, team needed it. Uh, you know, the goaltending for this team, it, they just they can't afford to have anything less than average goaltending. And if they're really going to get go far towards the Stanley Cup, they have to get above average goaltending. Um, and that might be a no bleep moment, but they, they can't afford for Cam Talbot either to have a bad night. They can't afford for Kapo Kakinen or whoever the backup goalie is to ble- be unplayable. I thought what Cam Talbot was able to give the Wild last night was a big one. And then offensively, too, yes, I mean, they got their defense engaged. Rem Pitlick, who will get to, had, I thought, a, a, an impressive performance. Their fourth line continues to be great. Yeah, I thought that was a their most complete, not sweating and not pulling out your hair and grinding your teeth win. It was a complete 60-minute win. Let's start on the blue line. Okay. Because I think rightfully so, when Suter got bought out, Susie was lost uh, to the Kraken, who who the Wild's going to play on Thursday in mm-hmm. Seattle. Um, Ian Cole, they tried to bring him back, but they couldn't. He ends up in Carolina. I think rightfully so. We said that's a lot of losses. Like like defense at the end of 2021 was depth. I mean, they had really nice depth. When when they went to training camp in 2021-22 for mm-hmm. this season, uh you had to go out and sign John Merrill. They went out and signed Ben Kulikov. So they definitely had to replenish the blue line. But so far, I am impressed. And I'll tell you a couple things. One, Goligoski is perfect. Mm-hmm. He's a perfect fit. He is, as far as I'm concerned, uh, right now, and so I'm not I'm not comparing careers. I want to be clear about that. I'm not trying to make a comparison on careers here. But Alex Goligoski, what he is bringing right now is the same, equal to what Suter brought, Without the baggage, without the baggage. So Spurgeon is now the clear-cut top defenseman on that pairing. 
Goligoski, incredibly solid, uh, can play a lot, does a very nice job. But he does, but again, you don't have to be concerned about the suitor dynamic there. He's not, there's no demands as far as I can tell. So, one, that swap to me for this team is damn near ideal. The yeah. second, the second thing is this one. Um, and I've been frustrated with this guy, and we both have been, and there have been times where we've liked him mm-hmm. and his play is up and down, but and it's six games, so the sample size is very, very small in an 82 game regular season. Dumba and the Dumba Brodeen pairing decks, I think, has been awesome. It's been outstanding. And Jonas Brodeen is so good and so sound and so solid that you literally don't notice him unless you watch him, but watch him and watch all of the things that he does um, defensively. And he scored a goal last night. But Dumba is doing all of the things that we talked about for how long, Declan? Jumping into the play, making offensive plays, uh, trusting that Brodeen will have his back if there is if there is a misplay defensively, which with Matthew Dumba, there's going to be. Yep. I absolutely six games in, I realize what I'm saying. And mm-hmm. I, I'd be curious to get your thoughts on this. Six games in, I so far love that pairing. And the Dumba goal uh that he took the pass from Pitlick last night for the third goal in the three two win to me. Uh, was exactly what Matthew Dumba at his best can bring. Yeah, I, I think they've kind of unleashed Matt Dumba. I think they, I think they've kind of taken the chains off him and reins off him a little bit. Uh, you know, we knew who he was pretty early into his career that he, uh, this guy was going to be an offensive first defenseman. He's going to have the potential to score double digit goals, uh, but he might be a defensive liability. So you know, he might not be always the, the complete defenseman. Y- he and we envisioned him to be when he was drafted eighth overall. But number one, I think he has made humongous strides defensively. Uh, and his numbers and even the eye test don't sug- uh, th- it doesn't paint the picture of him being a complete liability defensively. He's not. He's not. Is he a shut down Jonas Brodin? No, no, he's not. Jonas Brodin also, I believe, is in a class in a, in a class of his own right. But what Matt Dumba's been able to do through six games has been phenomenal. Um, offensively, this is exactly what you want. He's, he's taking a ton of shots. He's currently on pace for a, a career high in, in shots per game. Um, another thing which has been kind of interesting in his career is he's kind of flip flop. Sometimes they've done a really good job at using him in the offensive zone or starting him, I should, starting him in the offensive zone. And sometimes they've defaulted him starting in the defensive zone. Last year, he started in the defensive zone 53% of the time. Uh, only compared to 46% of the time last season. But this year, it's almost reversed. Small sample size, but still encouraging. 58% of the time, when he starts in the, in a zone, it's in the offensive zone. So they're, hmm. they're, they're literally putting him in more positions to be successful. And if he has Jonas Brodin, well, that's kind of a security blanket for him. That, that can help him and make up for deficiencies um, if he does get caught or if he does end up making um, a, a bad mistake. Analytically, he's been an absolute godsend. His Corsi is 54%. That's way above his career rate. If you want to look at Fenwick, which the difference between Corsi and Fenwick is Fenwick does not account for block shots. So Corsi is all shots attempted. Shots on goal, shots attempted, shots blocked. Mm -hmm. Fenwick takes the same equation, but they don't account for block shots because why would you account for an offensive shot that was blocked, right? Like never even came close to hitting towards the net or going towards the net. Mm -hmm. And his Fenwick is 57%. So that means when he is on the ice, his Tim and his teammates are out possessing the team 57% of the time. They're controlling the pace. He's been awesome. He, he, you can make a case that he has been not the MVP, but the, but the biggest bright spot, I think through the first six games of this season. And he's finally playing with the confidence that I think he has previously had and then lacked. And I think the difference now is for the first time in how long, because it's been a while, he basically knows he's not going to be traded, exposed in an expansion draft. Yeah. Like there was, it always felt like, and, and it was true. There was something hanging over Matthew Dumba's head as far as, will he be here? If he makes a mistake, will he be traded? Um, but this is, so I believe, I think I said this. I think I got frustrated. I'm pretty sure I did. During the Golden Knights playoff series last year, I think I got frustrated with Dumba and said, I'm just about out there, Dex. And now I think we're seeing what you said, which is him un- unleashed and him playing with complete confidence. 
And this is where you are going. This is what makes him special, right? Like he, he has a skill set that a lot of defensemen don't have. Now, can there be mistakes, bad mistakes at times? Absolutely. But right. When Brodeen is your defensive partner, that's huge. And when you have the ability offensively that he does to transition and shoot, it makes a big difference. Yeah. Yeah. It, well, what he's able to do offensively, I think is, is obviously phenomenal. I don't know if he'll be the guy that, you know, had what, 14, 13 goals before he had the pec injury now, almost three years ago, which is, cra- which is crazy how quickly time flies. Um, but I, I do think he's still a very capable and very good top four defenseman, you know, yeah, the, the trade talks have been around there for basically the better part of the last two years. You know, he only, I believe, has two year, one year after, uh, one year on his contract after this season. So you might even go to him starting with extension talks this summer if you want to kick that can and start or start that conversation or kick the can down the road eventually. But yeah, he's he's been a godsend. And I, I don't know if this can keep up. We'll, we'll have to wait and see. But in general, he has been probably, I, in my opinion, I think he has been the, the biggest positive for the Wild through the first six games. Well, if he's... Number one, I'd like to talk about what might be the second biggest bright spot, and it's really a trio of guys. The fourth line. Um, we compl- or I shouldn't say complained. We did complain, but we basically um, tried or didn't get or talked about fairly incessantly during last season why Sturm didn't get moved up. Like try him on the third line, the second line. He's really fast. He looks good. And there was a there was a clear hesitancy, and I think it was about his defensive play responsibility to put him on a higher line. And so he is still, as we start this season, on the fourth line. Uh, he's had Duham, who made the team out of training camp, on his wing. He had Bukestead. But last night, Dex, I think that Everson and Garen and the boys, I think they hit a sweet spot here. Okay? Yeah. Okay. Rem Pitlick comes out of the press box. Victor Rask is scratched, but Rem Pitlick does not ascend to the right wing on the second line. Bukestead, who I think looks really good. Like I've better, never, yeah. I, I don't, re- I don't remember when last year started, I, I thought, well, he's sort of slow and he's not that good. And then he grew on me a bit, but okay. he, he has looked in these first six games really good. Um, he definitely looks like he's healthier and faster. So he's been on the second line wing, uh, or he was, I should say, last night. So we got Sturm, Duhame, and Pitlick. Here's what I loved about it. The speed, Dex. That fourth line down to, uh, they were easily the best line against the Predators in what was a poor performance on Sunday. But last night again, in a game that, that the Wild, I thought, played well, uh, that fourth line still stood out. And in fact, what proved to be the game winning goal was Dumba from Pitlick and Duhame. Uh Sturm blocked a shot, I believe, in the groin that he didn't mean to block because it was a Dumba shot. He crumpled down, he came back and played. But the speed of that line and the energizer bunny aspect of that line, and in particular with Pitlick there and Bukestead promoted and Rask um, in, in the press box probably much on popcorn. I think that's a sweet spot here as far as the speed of this team goes. Yeah, I like it a lot too. Um, Rem Pitlick was a really good player at the U of M. Um, I covered him here for this station when he was a freshman. Uh, he was a prolific player at Shattuck St. Mary. And I wasn't surprised when he left after his junior season. He goes to Nashville. And at that time, Nashville was on on their downward spiral. They're or, or, or trending maybe, or trending water. I shouldn't say downward spiral. Uh, right. But in the AHL, he was prolific with Nashville. Didn't really wasn't able to find a way and find a way into a, the Nashville Predators lineup long term. He he's a talented player. Um, he's got skill. Th- th- this isn't just a fourth line body. And you could honestly, you could make a similar case that he could be a, a, a Nick Bukestead player. That Bukestead had size and, and had skill and came out of the U of M prolific and had a nice offensive start to a season, but he had to kind of refine his game. And Nick Bukestead has now kind of found an, a, a new uh, echelon of his game. It's not going to be the player he was at the U or beginning part of with the Florida Panthers. He's, he could have a really nice career as, as a bottom six guy. And I think Rem Pitlick can also be that kind of bottom six guy who has just a nice natural amount of skill. The pass to Matt Dumba, I mean, not a lot of guys can make that pass on this team. 
And I know that might sound crazy because, you know, Matt Zuccarello, Kirill, Kevin Fiala, but not a lot of guys can, especially bottom six guys, I should say, Saucer. can make that pass. Saucer. You can't you can't make that pass. No, and I, I, I think his skill set and having this fourth line being basically um, not just a fourth, uh, a fourth checking line, but a, a naturally skilled line. I mean, Duheim well, and Nico Sturm and Bukestad have been phenomenal this season. Usually a fourth line is is responsible for defensive responsibilities and and giving you know, eating up minutes, finding up a way to eat up 60 minutes a clock. And for whatever reason, when those three have been on the ice in Duheim, Sturm, and Bukestad, mm-hmm. they're out possessing teams. They're out chancing teams. Sturm, um, Sturm is really good. Like, yeah. like, I'm sorry. I still think he's good. I agree. Really I agree. He, I love he, his speed. When when they're on the ice together, those three, they're they're creating high danger chances at a 59% rate. Like that, that that should be honestly reversed right. or at fifty percent. It shouldn't make sense that a fourth line is creating more chances and, and especially high danger chances than they're allowing. And now, yeah, that might be some unsustainable there. That, I don't know if that that's that's consistent. But you have four lines right now that can roll. And mm-hmm. and I feel like Duheim has been also the forgotten soldier in this five and one start too. We were looking at Boldy and Rossi and Beckman as oh, which which one of these three top prospects are going to make the team, right? And then all of a sudden, he's just been quiet and steady. And now you're you're seeing it with your eye test. You can kind of see, oh, I see why he made the roster. And I also see why those guys were right to start in Iowa too, by the way. But Duheim and Sturm and Bukestad or whoever it is basically on the fourth line being elevated or dropped down, th- th- those have been really, really solid players for the Wild this season. And I, I think you're right in saying this with Duheim, Sturm, Bukestad, and now Pitlick. I think you're exactly right. Those guys aren't fourth line guys. Like they're threats to move up. And B- Bukestad has now. Uh, but those aren't guys who are like stuck perpetually. Like, oh, you're a fourth line guy and th- and that's it, right? Those are guys who are fourth line for now, but could threaten jobs because they're good enough to. Duheim, I'm, I'm going, to, going to make a comparison on Duheim here and see if you agree with me or not. Okay. When I when I watch him play, he's got speed. He's tough. He likes to shoot, mm-hmm. which you know I'll never be down on the guy for shooting, nope. especially in 2021 when when lots of guys don't shoot enough. Um, he's what we thought and probably hoped Ryan Donato could be, because yeah, Ryan he, Donato would yeah. shoot like. But but there were there was always something holding him back. Like the coaching staff, and, and he's now mm-hmm. gone from what he went from Boston, mm-hmm. got traded here in the Coil deal. Uh, got traded to the Sharks by Billy Guerin fairly quickly, it felt like. And now he, he's playing, and I think he scored a couple goals yeah, for the Kraken, Kraken. and we'll, we'll see him tomorrow night in Seattle. But I always liked the fact that Donato would shoot, but there was clearly always something that the coaching staff didn't like. I think Duheim brings the package that Ryan Donato didn't have. Yeah, it's it's a good comparison. I think I think his game's a little bit more refined. Um, it helps yeah. too. He's a little bigger. Agreed. He's six two, two hundred yes. plus pounds. You know, Donato kind of gets pushed around a little easily, and but he let himself get pushed around too. Yep. Yeah. You can be you can be a small guy and be effective in this league. You can absolutely one hundred percent can. Uh, that, that was I think the mo of the NHL about six seven years ago when Johnny Goudreau broke in. It's like oh, little guys can be successful again. You know, these are look at these Martin St. Louis or Johnny Goudreaux that come in our littler guys, but they're built like a brick house, especially like St. Louis, and you don't mess with them. Like even though he's five nine, he'll still outwork you. Um, I think with Duheim. He this might be a nice yeah a little diamond in the rough finding. He was really good at Providence, um, in the college hockey scene, and he Small was just college a, line too. Yes, yeah, Pitlick, it is. Sturm, Duheim, yeah, all I love college it. line. That's a Declan Goff line. I know. As a college hockey lover, I'm all for that. Pitley, I know. I, I I love that. Um, and in the AHL, he was just a, a nice player for them. Uh, you know, he logged over 82 games over the last two seasons in Iowa. He deserved a call up. Um, these are good good signs to have. Uh. Th- it, it shouldn't make sense that a fourth line is this amount of speed and skill. And I'm curious if, you know, eventually they get exposed or they're asked to do more defensive things. You know, I I, I want to see what they do over the course of a longer sample size. But in general, that they've they've been phenomenal. I wouldn't mess with that at all. I don't think the dean is going to ask people. I, I think the one thing that's become pretty clear about him, and I like this. I don't think he's going to ask people to do things they can't do. But like he seems to, and, and this sounds so simple, but a lot of guys, and th- th- it's not just. Um, hockey it's throughout sports a lot of coaches seem to ask players to do things they can't do because they should do them it feels like dean has has a sweet spot here of he knows what guys are capable of and he wants that from them but i don't think he asked them to do a lot more than that 
Do you like, like with that fourth line, it feels like they're put in positions to succeed. And then Dean says, I should use them more, which I think he said now twice about that line in particular, yeah. um, the Brodeen Dumba pairing. And, Cause I'm, I'm with you. It feels like, and I think this goes beyond him just being more comfortable because the trade talk is dead. Now it feels like Dumba, like the wild is, is appealing to his strengths. And if you do that, he's probably going to succeed. It's when you ask him to do things outside his comfort zone and outside the box that he doesn't. And I love the fact that if it, this team seems to have a pretty good gauge on who its personnel is and how to use them best. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I still disagree on how to use Fiala. I, th- I think there's, there's still some, they're asking him to do it. And he's, he's delivering on, Hey, I'll, I'll play this penalty kill. I want to be a better player. I think he has been vocal and, and, that's encouraging on that part of him to say like I want to be a more complete player. Put me on the penalty kill. I want I want to earn my next contract. Um, but in general, yeah, I, I think uh, it's encouraging that they're giving the fourth line um, more opportunities. And you know, I, I think Ryan Carter and Lapanta said on the broadcast last night that they were a little surprised maybe that he didn't start the game with that line because because that line's been pretty damn good for them. Yeah. Um, but in general, it's it's a it's a, not a traditional fourth line. It isn't. I like the fact that he started. Uh, in fact, I think it was the first time in the first six games. I like the fact that Dean started the first line last night because that line is important and was coming off a bad game. I think it's all mind games, which is mm-hmm. brilliant. Which is brilliant. But but that fourth line played so well that I don't think like they had to be out there at the start and it's such a small thing cuz it's it's one shift so ultimately who cares but i think he started that first line cuz they didn't play well and he's like we are coming off a flat game and if we're going to be successful you guys have to produce and they they did get the, the first goal at least matt's did um so yeah i i just i think they're doing a good job I, i'll say this about your guy fiala who by the way had a lot of opportunities last night. I know on that second Vancouver goal, he got criticized, but he also did a lot of good things last night as far as yeah. effort and potential goals, and, and he didn't score. Um, with Bukestead being promoted to that line, I like that line. It's, it's Rask who slows it down. Goudreau, to me, I had no idea. He's actually pretty good. Yeah, He, he can is. really I'll- skate. Yeah. He can facilitate. Um, I love the speed. I think if you if if Bukestead's in place of Rask on that line, I don't hate that. I yeah, I'll eat a, I'll eat a little bit of crow. I thought Goudreau was just a just a random fourth line grinder who just couldn't find his way into the lineup. No, he's got some actual legitimate skill. So did I. Um, and and speed. So and that's I. no problem. By the way, this show admits when we're wrong. Yeah. Every Wednesday and, uh, and Thursday on yeah. Score North. And all the time, too. Because and all just, the time in general. Because it's fine to be wrong. Um, but yes, I thought the same. You you are not alone. I think we all thought, like, who's the slappy who's played a ton of games <laughs> in, in the American Hockey League? So yeah. I'm just saying, the more I watch him play, yep. if this is him, he's good. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I agree with your assessment. I mean, on Victor Rass, that is. Like, Slows it down. It's, it's hey... It's so hard to just move that contract and move move it without taking back either something bad or giving up an asset as a sweetener to get it off your hands. Right. But I mean, and I guess I don't really care. But like, are you are you going to put him in the press box for the majority where, of this season and be a healthy scratch? Where does he play though, Dex? I know. Look, like he's look, they have four good lines. Yep. Previously, I always said stick him on the fourth line. But you can't do that now. The fourth line's good, and and it's fast. The Wild, I would argue that since uh, their inception in 2000, 2001, that overall, the Minnesota Wild has never been this fast. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah. They've never been this fast. And Rask slows it down. It's it's not his, I mean, it's it's not his fault. He's just not quick enough to keep up with this team. There are teams on which he might fit. He doesn't fit now here. No. And, and, and Pitlick who took a bad penalty, who certainly is not a perfect player, but his skill set, what he brings, fits. Yes. He's fast. And and if you can bump Bukestead up, like if you come to me right now and say, all right, um, <laughs> Fiala, Goudreau, and Rask, Ugh. or Fiala, Goudreau, and Bukestead, 
I'm or, like, or even Pit, or even Pitlick, or Pitlick even Pitlick. Yes. Right. But I'm like, I'm like the third yeah. choice there is Victor Rask, right? Yes, 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 one hundred. And I do like, and I do also, despite the defensive bad play, and it's what holds him back, and it's why the coaching staff and Garen get mad. Um, I do like what Fiala has brought. Yeah, like like Kaprizov is scuffling for sure. Greenway, I'm still, I, and I know that Dean said last night, quote, he was a man, which is good, which means that he played a physical game. Uh, those two, I'm still like, I need to see a lot more. Kevin Fiala, I am not down on. Not no, right I'm not, now, I'm at not, least. I'm not down on him either. Um, like I said, I, th- I think the vocalness and him, Sarah McClellan did a great piece on him in the strip um, about him wanting to be a more of a complete player. And I think it'd be really easy for him because he has already said, yeah, I was pissed off that I didn't get a contract and I'm playing with my head on fire, paraphrasing a little bit there at the beginning of training camp. And he could just he could just use that energy and channel it, which he does, and just been Kevin Fiala, right? Like he could have just been who Kevin Fiala has been the last few years. And instead, he's trying to find a, a, a different aura of his game. I think it's great that the coaching staff is putting him on the penalty kill. I think that's huge. Um and he has to. He, I, I, at the end of the day, he's most likely going to outprice himself from finding a new contract with this team. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we had Greg Wasinski on from ESPN a couple weeks ago on Mackie and Judd, and he said, and, and he is right in this in this assessment that hockey is the one sport where when you get a buy in, that he might even buy in and 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 be okay with taking maybe a lesser deal that he could get on the open market or from another team if he really likes the fit here. Um, I think Fiala, at the end of the day, is going to want to get paid, and he wants dollars, and he wants also the right situation, too. I won't say he's just going to go to Ottawa because they gave him 8 to $9 million per. Right. But but I do think his mindset and the way he's carrying himself is very encouraging. It's very encouraging. Yes. Yeah. And uh, we, we can certainly talk about if Kaprizov continues to struggle, talk about that after the Kraken game. Um, also, I also want, want to see the penalty kill what, one more time because I got to – it's not a hot take. I got an opinion Ooh. about the PK and there's something I like about it. And there's something okay. I don't. And the part I don't like, I think is, is costing them. But unless you have final thoughts, Declan Goff, I think we say goodbye for now. Yeah. Um, I think we say goodbye for now, but five and one to start the season. An awesome start. I love my ESPN plus, by the way, I still love my ESPN plus. It's been great. It's been absolutely great. Yeah, it's a I, great I package. love it. It's I love the package. crease. Um, I love the, the point games. show they do on Thursday as well. I love that. Um, this is awesome, man. I I, I love it. And there's going to be some hiccups. I get Imagine that, that hockey back on on yeah. the biggest uh, sports it, network okay. in the country. And and last thing, uh, you know, it's just it stinks because I think hockey had such great PR with the move to ESPN and ESPN pumping their tires, and with this horrible, just honestly disgusting situation that's happening with the Blackhawks. It's just oh, like yeah. ah. Damn it, hockey! Like just like, like every time, two steps forward, one step back, right? Like that's the, that's just this league, and so that part's you know we don't we're not going to go into detail on that necessarily, but that that part's a little frustrating because I think it's been such well, a great first week for the NHL that that's just kind of now a punch in the gut. I will say this: Bettman and and the Gents did the right thing, though. Unlike the National Football League, releasing as disturbing as the full report on the Blackhawks, basically sexual scandal was. Um, kudos to the league for putting it all out because this Washington thing in football, is a complete mess and the league is clearly hiding something and it looks better to get everything out there and for people to be disturbed, which they should be as opposed to what football is trying to to do, which is suppress it and be like, there's nothing to see here. (laughs) And we're all like, that's a bunch of BS. All right. We will be back. I believe uh, Dex on Friday, correct? to uh, yes. talk about Kraken and Wild as we head into the weekend. The Wild, by the way, plays the Kraken on Thursday, and then we'll play Colorado on Saturday before coming home next Tuesday uh, for their next home game. Declan, it's all yours. Pass.